So the, the last person I just want to chat about briefly is a, is a gentleman that I've been working with for the last 20 years. And I have been really, really blessed and honored to work with this architect. This is Art Gensler. And uh, I originally went to Gensler with the idea of staying there for five years and moving on, opening up my own office. And Art you know, taught me the one thing that's been fundamental to my life, I think, in, in my career as an architect, and that is continue to create your own challenges, you know, create your own opportunities. And, and when Art first um, recruited me to Gensler, along with a guy named Jim Follett, who's a dear friend of mine, uh, Art called me in, and I didn't really want to join Gensler. I was, you know, he said, you know, we were talking and talking, and then I said, you guys are too big and you're too bureaucratic, and you know, you don't like love design as much as you know I think you should. And he said, you know, and he said, well, he said I don't necessarily, you know, believe any of that stuff. And he said, but he said, you know, we've never made a lateral hire before. We had one. He said we made one lateral hire. You're a second, one lateral hire, and that person lasted about three months and they were fired. He said, so I don't think this is going to necessarily work. That's what he's telling me. He said, but he said, I can tell you one thing. If you join our firm, I will never tell you no. I'll never tell you no. You'll be able to do whatever you want to do. I'll give you guidance. I'll give you direction. I'll give you support. And he has been, Bill knows this. I mean, Bill, he's been a, he's an amazing person. And he is, we just got a letter. He's retiring from the board this year after he's 70 years old and he started the firm when he was 35 years old. So it's been extraordinary working with Art. So all this comes together for me sort of in Asia, this idea of creating opportunities and anything you can do anything and storytelling and all that. Just a little bit of background in Asia. Uh, I started working there in would have been early 1980s, we had a small operation in Hong Kong and a guy, one of my partners, Peter Gordon, was in charge of the operation and another one of my partners, I mentioned Jim Follett, he was also working with Peter. And then Jim, you know, I had a chance to open up the Detroit, this is never saying no, right? Got a chance to work on the GM headquarters here and open up the Detroit office and then Jim and I opened up Chicago and I opened up four or five offices on the west coast and did all this, we started new practice areas and retail and we got into graphic design and branding and all these kinds of things. And then in the late 90s, we sort of, we dropped architect from our names, not Gensler Architect, because we tried to look at architecture as a broad based, not just architecture, it was design, it encompassed all these kinds of things. So when we had expanded domestically, you know, I was looking for the next thing to do and I was looking at, and it was nothing to do with us, vision for Asia at the time, but I started to get involved in Asia and I went to Hong Kong and struggled to make that office work for 10 years and then in the early 2000s, uh, there was another partner of mine, Jun Shaw, who um, actually was from Shanghai and he ended up going back and he wanted to start an office and so we moved our Hong Kong operation to Shanghai. And it has been, I never thought I'd be there and now we have offices in I opened up office, I guess, in Tokyo or in Seoul. Shanghai, we have 120. Beijing, we've got 20. And we're in Singapore and we've got 30 in Bangalore. But I've been able to do these things and work on projects that have just been in, in, amazing projects over the years just by sort of looking out and trying to understand what the next opportunity sort of looks like. And so from this sort of Asia experience, you know, this is now in China. We've been in China for about... I guess eight years now, comes along this project. And this is one that I did want to show you guys. And um, it's the Shanghai Tower. And it was, just as a little bit of background, it, it was a, a competition that really went on for about five years. And originally, we lost the competition. And then we came in last. And then the second time around, we came in second. And then the third time around, uh, which was actually, about a, again, about a five-year time frame, it came down to Skidmore, us, KPF, and Foster. And I got to tell you guys that, you know, you talk about anything is possible, you know, pursuing your personal passions, all these kind of things. The firm, Gensler, the firm had never done a building over, I was working on one that was 50 stories. And this is the second tallest building in the world. So it came down to a real battle. And 
we storyboarded, we had a war room, and we storyboarded everything out. We storyboarded what Skidmore would do, what we thought Foster would do, everything. And then when it came down to Foster and ourselves, we storyboarded what we thought their response was going to be. And, and what we tried to do was to engage the client and bring them in and try to make it not an office building. It was something else. It was a gift to China. It was about the emergence of China as an economic power, of Shanghai as a financial center, a gift to all the people of China, a symbol for what China could become. And the form and all these kinds of things came out of this whole storyboarding <coughs> process. And I ultimately believe that we won was partially because of that. So I'm going to show you, what I'm going to show you is the, the video. This is the competition video. Okay, this is a couple of minutes long. So this is about, I think, maybe two years old now, if it works. And I picked the music, by the way. Those are 50-story buildings around it, if you get an idea of the scale of the building. See if I can do this thing. There we go. I've got PowerPoints embedded in PowerPoints, Flash. I got it, so this whole thing could easily crash. But um, <laughs> I do have notes for some of this technical stuff here. But you know, but I, I think I can do this without most of them. You guys probably have questions. By the way, this is the same stool that I had when I was. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is this is actually pretty cool. Yeah. But I I do think that we won. I, I think that we won the project for one, you know, I told you the story about, you know, the storyboarding, the building itself, but I also think there's one other reason we won the project, and that is that I think unlike the other architects, uh, we went into Asia, we've gone into Asia making a commitment to build practices in Asia, okay, and that was originally our vision, 
And a lot of people said we were nuts, including, I guess Gene Cohn was here last week, right, or something. So Gene's been a friend of the firm for a long time. And Gene and a lot of the other guys would say, and Skidmore guys would say, you guys, you guys are nuts. They, were, they would go over, get the work, and they'd bring it back to Chicago or New York or San Francisco and work on it. We decided that we weren't going to do that. We said that we believe, I believe, happen to personally believe, that better architecture comes out of people who are engaged in the design process that are part of the community and that we're going to make a commitment to grow a local practice, bring along young design professionals, bring the best in the world to Shanghai, and we're going to design this project in Shanghai. And you know what? That struck a really important chord, I think, with the client, because the, the client is sort of quasi-government. And, uh, and we've done that. And now it's really weird, because we have all these offices growing in Asia, and now I hear these people speaking on this thing that they call global, Global but local, right? I guess that's what we are. I mean, we're, our staff in Shanghai is, as they say, 120, and there's probably 40 expats from around the world and 80 local design professionals. I'll tell you, the kids coming out of the schools in Asia are just like they are here. They're fabulous. I mean, the kids everywhere are fabulous. They're really talented individuals. So this is, I'm going to go through the building a little bit, and uh, this is, it's the third building of three buildings. This is the Jin Mao Tower by Skidmore. All right, you guys are familiar with Jin Mao. It's a gorgeous building. In, in my mind, and this is the way that we characterize them, I'm not sure Skidmore would agree, but this is really more of a gesture to China past, pagoda form, beautiful stainless steel structure, beautiful filigree, wonderfully executed, typical Skidmore. Uh, not typical in terms of design, typical I think in terms of the quality of what was done. This is the KPF building. This is Gene's building. He, I think he, did he show this one last? Yes, he did. So he showed this KPF building, beautifully detailed. We said that was really China present, and then ours is really China future. And it's the idea that this is sort of emerging, and I, I'll get a little bit into the form. It is the second tallest building in the world and the tallest composite structure in the world. And you can get an idea. There's KPF. I think this is at four. 91, we're at 632. There's Burj Dubai, right? So that's the tallest. And here's Sears Tower. So Sears Tower is right about in there, somewhere in that zone. But we toyed with the idea of making it taller, making it the tallest. Uh, we felt that the design didn't work. And quite frankly, I think that, you know, the Chinese government said, you know what, we don't want to be the tallest, we want to be the best. So we back down from being the tallest, but it is the second tallest. And I'm sure there will be others that are taller. So the question always comes up about the form. And uh, a lot of people call it the dragon tower. It was never the, the, the idea of a dragon was never the idea. It was never anything part of the original concept. The form was really derived from a bend in the Hongpu River Ben actually makes a, a turn. If you draw a, 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 your hands around the three buildings, they almost form a perfect triangle. So it was a bend in the river. It was a relationship, which is good feng shui, between the three buildings. It was the idea that it comes up and it's emerging and it's sort of turning. So it was a dynamic form. And that was the sort of symbolism associated with this emerging China. And it is a, a pretty simple building in the sense that it's got a round core, and I can show you later. And then it's got a sort of an inner circular form, and then there's a second curtain wall, there's a dual curtain wall, double curtain wall system, and the second curtain wall turns around the outer one. It's retail on the first floor, and then there are these zones, and each zone is broken by a mechanical floor and what they call refuge floor, which is required in China so that if there's a fire, you can go down to a refuge floor and not have to get out of the building. This building will house about uh, 10,000 people. So it has been, as we've been working on this, we've been uh, in many, 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 many ways writing the high-rise, super high-rise codes in China while we've been working on it because a lot of the codes don't exist. In fact, this is the first building in China that you're going to be used you're going to be able to use elevators as a means of egress. It's, the idea behind it is it's stacked neighborhoods. So each neighborhood, 
this is, you know, one of these sections here. One of these sections is considered to be a neighborhood. So there's a, a what we would call a sort of podium level, and then each one of these neighborhoods has a 14-story atrium space. So you're stacking buildings on top. They're essentially independent buildings stacked on top of one another. Center core, turning skin, and as this triangular form turns, it forms an atrium. It forms an atrium that varies from about 27 feet to about 36 feet, going up in the entire building. So you can see this is an atrium space, atrium space, and then as it turns, it's on the back side of this building. So it's the idea of trying to take, I mean, the, the tough thing about a building like this is how do you deal with the scale? You know, how do you deal with something this large? I mean, if you guys have ever been in any of the buildings in China, this is a really, really tough scale to deal with. And how do you break it down? The other, the other goal with this neighborhood concept is that if you go into the Jin Mao Tower and you go in the KPF building, they're essentially closed buildings. You can go in, go to the retail, go up to the hotel level and the observation level, and that's it. You can't do anything else. You don't even know what's going on in the building. These neighborhoods are all going to be open, and there's going to be cultural events on each one of these atrium spaces. People are going to be able to enter the building and actually go through the entire building, not just the observation floors, but essentially all the other floors. Shanghai, uh, I just took my wife there recently, but I don't know if any of you have been to Shanghai, but it's the idea is that you know, there's a, it's a city of parks. I mean, there's parks everywhere, and they're beautifully maintained parks in Shanghai. So these atrium spaces are also what we would call parks. So you can see how large they are. Here's the one below it. Here's the refuge floors, right? Mechanical and refuge floors here, and these are the atrium spaces. And it's this idea of neighborhoods, city of parks, you know, people don't necessarily have to leave the building to, you know, go to lunch or go to a cultural event. They can go down to any one of these parks and there's different things going on. And so this is part of the basic concept of the building. Now, the, the toughest part, and I have to, we're, I was talking to Dr. Walker about it today with the engineers because there are a lot of engineers that said this building couldn't be done. Um, and it's, it's because the center core, this is the center, it's a dual curtain wall system. This is a center building, and this is a typical curtain wall system. So you've got just a cylindrical building with the curtain wall adhered to it, right? Which is easy to handle structurally, it's right there. Now, this, this curtain wall system, the outer curtain wall system, which is 30 some feet away, minimum, how is it supported? How do you build it, right? Because it's easy to build it when it's up against the concrete structure. So we had, originally the engineers said it couldn't be done, and then they said it couldn't handle the wind loads. And there are some engineers today that would say that it can't be done. Um, we had, we had uh, over 100 expert panels, Chinese panels of experts and people from around the world looking at all aspects of the building, and the curtain wall was one of the most important. So essentially what it is, is that it's a bicycle spoke. So the the main core of the building is the center of the wheel, and these spokes come out, and actually what happens is the curtain wall is hung from, from above, so it's on basically a cable structure. Now, the, the most complicated part about it is really building it, because there's nothing to support this. So basically, all this is going to be built, curtain wall is going to go on, this structure is going to go on, and then we're going to hang these rods, and then the curtain wall is going to basically go up the, up the rod system. So it's pretty astounding. It is a, it's a lead, it, we just got lead gold, uh, pre-certified lead gold. USGBC was over there, but I was over there with the president of USGBC. We're going for platinum, but it is a lead building. 